أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome back brothers and sisters um, We are still discussing uh, this special series on welcoming Ramadan 1445 Hijriya نحن الحمد لله بدأ قرية صفر الله We are probably a day or two away from um, maybe a couple of days inshallah away from the start of Ramadan نعم Uh, we were discussing uh, various aspects um, for those who are joining for the first time. I believe I see some new names, alhamdulillah. Uh, you can catch up on the recordings on my YouTube channel if you've missed them. Uh, we talked about the aqidah aspects of fasting and then we're now in the fiqh aspects of fasting. And as usual, I just have a small quiz to refresh what we covered last week. Naam. Um, we talked about suhoor, iftar, you know, Uh, certain uh, sunnan uh, aspects of fasting Ramadan and the etiquettes of fasting. So uh, the first question, and, and you can use the chat box to put in your answers, inshallah. Uh, when should one stop suhoor? So when should one stop eating and drinking, right? Suhoor. A, the false dawn. B, the true dawn. C, when the disk of the sun disappears. Or D, at the imsak time. So when should one stop eating and drinking? So A, B, C, or D? Now. For those who didn't attend last week or have not seen the recording, you'll probably not know what is a false dawn and a true dawn. Uh, but that's fine, inshallah. Uh, you can give it a shot. Someone says D. Okay. Any, any other answers? Just one student. Type. Someone else says B. Type. So we have two Ds. Type. Um, D, B, D. Okay, so brothers, like we said last week, uh, there are two dawns which happen every day or every night rather, yeah, in the morning uh, before the fajr. One is a false dawn which happens initially, uh, and this is not the time when you stop eating and drinking, and this is when you will be said you will see pillars of light streaming, uh, sorry, shooting upwards from the horizon. This is a false dawn, and then it disappears after after a very short time. And becomes again pitch dark, very dark. And then after a while, you have the true dawn. The true dawn. And you see a white uh, streak of light running across the horizon from, uh, you know, north to south or whatever. It, it, it cut, cuts across the horizon horizontally. Now that is the true dawn. This is when you stop eating suhoor. This is when you stop eating and drinking. This is the true dawn. And this is when, inshallah, the adhan is supposed to be given for Salat al Fajr. Yeah. Of course, C is false. And D, uh, some of you said D. D is something like we discussed last week again, uh, very uh, popular in the subcontinent uh, called Imsak, and they print it on the timetables like 10 minutes before Adhan of Fajr. And if you ask them why, they say just to make sure, you know, you don't, you don't keep eating and drinking and, and you want to stop earlier on. That we said is an innovation. It's a bid'ah. It is not from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because we saw the hadith last week Rasulullah said, if somebody has a glass of water in his hand and he's drinking and he hears that then he can finish the water. He can finish the water. So how can he, why do you want to stop eating 10 minutes before Adhan? Right? So this concept of imsak is something innovated in the deen. It is not from the deen. It is a bid'ah. And one can eat and drink until the true dawn. Until uh, the true dawn. And if the modern is, is trustworthy, when you hear the Adhan, you can, you can stop. Assuming he gives the adhan at the right time. Nah, nah. Baraklah bikum. Time. So the correct answer was B out there. Uh, we are commanded to delay. Right? We are commanded to delay uh, suhoor and hasten iftar. Hasten is to make it early. Yeah? Commanded to delay suhoor and hasten iftar. True or false? Again, we talked about this last week, the hadith. This is just a quick refresher of what we did last week through a quiz. Nah, nah. Alhamdulillah. 
Okay, this is all if you got right, alhamdulillah. So it is true. Now, Rasulullah said, my ummah will be on the right path and it will be safe as long as they delay suhoor and they hasten iftar. This is another hadith to disprove insak. Because Rasulullah is saying, delay suhoor. Do, you can eat and drink till the last minute. So you don't have to stop 10 minutes in advance like the insak. This is wrong. Now, barakah. Now, taib. The dua for breaking the fast. The dua for breaking the fast. Dhahab al dama'ah. Abdullah Uruk, Matabat al Ajr, insha'Allah, is recited just after iftar, before iftar, or just before iftar, or there is no prescribed time, and it can be done anytime. Now, now, alhamdulillah, it's all easy, yeah, but the point is just to revise what, what we did last week. So, this is the dua which is proven in the sunnah, like you said. There are other, other supplications which people use. In different parts of the world, some of them are, are weak, some of them are fabricated. Naam, uh, this is the Sahih uh, hadith with this dua. And as you can see, it is past tense, dhahaba. Dhahaba is already done, it is madi, it is past tense. So as soon as you eat or drink, as soon as you break your fast, inshallah you can recite this dua. Now, so I have the last question which category should make up missed Ramadan fasts after Ramadan? Because we also just started discussing last week, for those of you who didn't join me last week. Uh, again, please go back to the recordings. It's very important on my YouTube channel. There's a playlist called uh, Welcoming Ramadan or Ramadan, sorry, Ramadan 1445, Hijriya. So in this playlist, you will find all the previous class recordings. So we talked about, we just started talking about the people who uh, can break their fast, who have a Sharia reason. Yeah. So this question is based on that. Which category should make up missed Ramadan fasts? After Ramadan, the traveler, menstruating ladies, temporary illness, people with some temporary illness, or D, all of the above. Now, somebody was very, uh, very uh, soon giving the answer. So you wait, wait till you finish seeing all the options because sometimes. Uh, you know, you, you think you have the right answer, but then there's a better answer, yeah? Na, na, na. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah, barakallah. Yes, so the correct answer is D. All of these categories, like we just started discussing last week, they can, they can break their fast. They have a Sharia reason, but they have to make up after Ramadan. Uh, the sisters as well, uh, but the sisters will not make up the salawat. Uh, though they don't pray, they don't pray those number of days, X number of days, they will not make up their salawat. Now, so yes, the answer was D. So, like we said, the suhoor is blessed. It has to be taken. Even, even like we said, you get up late and you just see one minute left, maybe half a minute for the adhan. Have something, even, even a half a glass of water, a sip of water, a small date, Anything, because there is great baraka, baraka in, in the suhoor. There is great baraka. That is sufficient for you to last the whole day. Alhamdulillah. And Rasulullah said, what a blessing, uh, what a what a great suhoor is tamar, dates. Nama suhurun, mumin, for the mumin, tamar, the dates. Now, so it's good to have dates uh, in the morning. It gives you that energy as well. Now, uh, we talked about this, so I'm just... Quickly skipping through. And this is the hadith we talked about uh, in Sahih Bukhari and Fatal Bari that the people will be fine or my ummah will be fine as long as they do not delay iftar. In another hadith, as they hasten iftar and they delay suhoor. And we said the Rafidah, the Shia, they delay their iftar. They eat uh, and drink only when they see the stars in the night sky. That's when they actually break their fast, which is wrong, of course. Now, so let's continue. We were discussing uh, people who are exempted from fasting who have a valid reason to break their fast. We said the travelers, the menstruating ladies, and people with a temporary illness. Here, yeah, but temporary illness, again, just to remind ourselves, brothers, I'm not talking about a slight headache or a slight cold. Huh? No, this is not what we mean. This is not an excuse to break the fast. A person has to fast. If he has a headache, he fasts. He has a cold, he fasts. He has a cough, he fasts. These are not temporary illnesses. Here, I mean some, let's say, I don't know, high viral fever or something, la qadar Allah, something like this, or some, some illness which you will, inshallah, recover from. 
In this case, you break your fast if that is required for the medicines uh, and so on and so forth. Um, likewise, we also have the weak and old people and people with a permanent illness, uh, which is not, you know, uh, potentially by medical science, they, they say there is no cure for it or it doesn't, it's, it's difficult, or it's something continuous, terminal, long lasting. In this case, they cannot obviously make up. They cannot make up because even after Ramadan, they will have the same problem, right? So in this case, they feed and we'll see what they feed, inshallah. Hamza bin Amr al-Salami, he said, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this hadith also we saw, because some people ask that, okay, I'm traveling, but I still want to fast, Ustad. Okay, I don't want to break the fast. I, I can fast. It's a flight. It's an it's a airplane journey, whatever. Uh, I still want to fast. So this hadith replies that question. So Hamza asked Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that I find myself strong enough to fast while traveling. Would it be wrong for me to do so? Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, replied, it is a ruqsa, it is an allowance given by Allah, so that if anyone is not capable, he has done no wrong. And if anyone wishes and is able to fast, he would not be guilty of sin. So, if somebody feels he, he cannot do that journey while traveling, alhamdulillah, he breaks the fast, it's a ruqsa, alhamdulillah. If somebody feels that I can manage, inshallah, I'm okay, and he starts fasting, he is not guilty of a sin. Someone else may start fasting thinking it's okay, but then something may happen, la qadr Allah, and he feels he has to break his fast. He cannot continue any, anymore. He can still do that. He can break his fast. There is no sin on him, inshallah, because he's traveling. He's traveling. But he has to make up that day afterwards. Yeah? So that is this way we stopped because I wanted to spend some time on this uh, slide. Uh, what about a person who starts Ramadan in one city, right? And in the end of Ramadan, he travels to another city, right? Uh, for example, uh, so let's say somebody is traveling from uh, the Gulf region to, let's say, India or Pakistan, right? Usually in India and Pakistan, the fasting uh, usually, usually starts a day later, maybe two sometimes, but usually a day later, yeah? So let's say the brother started fasting in, in, in the Gulf country, uh, he, alhamdulillah, and now he is on his 29th fast. 29 days, right? Or let's say 30 days. This is last fasting. Last fast. Because the Hijri month is only 29 or 30. There is no 31. The Hijri calendar has only 29 or 30. So he is on the 30th, the last day, and the next day is Eid in the Gulf country. But now he has to travel. He travels to, let's say, Pakistan, right? Where they are still fasting the 29th. But he actually has technically has finished his month. The 30 days fasting is finished. But now in Pakistan, they're still fasting. And usually after you finish fasting 30 days, what is the next day? Eid. You have to celebrate Eid. So can he celebrate Eid alone in Pakistan? No. Eid is a, a, is a congregational celebration. It is something you do in a jama'ah, in a society, in, in the family, uh, with all the Muslims. You do not celebrate Eid alone. And the hadith of Rasulullah, as you can see there on the slide, fast when everyone is fasting and break your fast when everyone is breaking their fast. So he will fast in Pakistan along with his brothers and sisters there. And when they celebrate Eid, he will celebrate Eid. But Ustad, he's done 31 days. That's fine. The extra day for him is nafil, nafil fasting. Because his Ramadan month is finished. You get the point. Likewise, it could be the other way around as well. So a person is doing, um, let's say, 29 or 28 days. Let's say 28, 28 days now in Pakistan. And he travels to the Gulf country. Now here, they're going to celebrate Eid the next day. Khalas, their fasting is finished. 29 days is finished for them. They're going to celebrate Eid. So what does he do? Does he fast on Eid? No. Because it is haram to fast on Eid. It is haram to fast Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. It is haram, prohibited. And if someone does that, he is liable to being punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does he do? He has only, only 28 days. The month has to be at least 29. So what does he do? Because hadith says, break your fast with everyone who is breaking their fast. Now in the Gulf country, they're, break, they're breaking their fast. They're going to celebrate Eid. So he celebrates Eid with them. And after that, the second of Shawwal, if he wishes second or third, he makes up one extra day, the 29th of Ramadan, which he missed. Clear? Wada? 
If you have any questions, we can do them, inshallah, in the end. Now, we also talked about this traveling in air. Sometimes you take off and on the ground, and this happens many times, it's the sun has set. The disk has gone below the horizon and you break your fast. When the plane takes off, you can see the sun still now because you're gone up to a higher altitude. You can still see the sun and from that altitude of 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, the sun is still visible. So what do I do? Do I continue fasting again? No. You broke your fast, finish, alhamdulillah, that's it for you. No, no issues for you, right? Time. Now the, the sick and the elderly. So like we said, these are not uh, issues for breaking the fast, a slight cough or a cold or a headache. No, the person will, will still fast. But if a person has a chronic illness, uh, long term, la qadar Allah, may Allah keep us all safe and our elders safe and give them good health, inshallah. I mean, and the elderly, people who are old, they may, somebody needs maybe a dialysis every day, la qadar Allah, somebody needs uh, um, a diabetic medicine, injections, whatever. Yeah, these, these cases are there in, in the society now. So what does he do? Because he can't make up. This, this is a long term uh, situation for him. So he has to feed a poor person, a Muslim. I should have put Muslim there. A poor, hang on, just give me a minute. Let me just add that. So it's clear. Now, so he will feed a poor Muslim huh, with half a sa of the staple food of his country for every day that he has missed the fast. So if a person ends up missing the missing, sorry, missing the whole month, 30 days, for example, he will feed a poor Muslim. Half a sa. In those days, brothers and sisters, they didn't have kilograms uh, or grams as weights or, or units of measure. They had a sa, mud, these kind of things. And sa is approximately equivalent to uh, one and a half kilograms uh, in, in today's, um, what do you say, weights. Yeah, Approximately one and a half kilograms, half a sa. And a full sa is obviously three, approximately three kilograms. So approximately a half, sorry, one and a half kilograms of whatever food he eats. So if he is eating uh, rice of superior quality, let's say, I don't know, 50 reals per kilo, for example, yeah, superior quality rice. But for feeding, he feeds 20 reals per kilo rice. This is wrong. This is wrong. Because he is, why, why is he feeding? Because he cannot fast. And this is a, a, a flexibility from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is an allowance given to him that he can make up this issue because Ramadan fasting is a very serious matter. It's fard. It's a pillar of Islam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him an exit, gave him a, 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 an allowance to be able to make up that by feeding somebody. So he feeds them maybe maybe 80, 80 riyals a kilo rice, even better than what he eats. That's better for him, inshallah. Obviously, assuming he can afford it. Right? So you can call the person for iftar, for example, give him iftar, for example. Now, uh, some scholars say you have to give him suhoor and iftar because normally you will have suhoor and iftar. But Allah, you could do that, or you could at least give him a nice meal, uh, kabza, biryani, whatever, for iftar, alhamdulillah. Uh, so he's pleased, and you have made that up as, as an allowance. Um, so he can, if he misses 30 days, he can do. Uh, one Muslim every day. So he tells him, okay, you come to my house every day for the next month. Alhamdulillah. Or, or the scholars also allow this. They say he can give 30, sorry, feed 30 poor Muslims one day. So he has a big feast, invites 30 poor Muslims, one iftar and dinner. Halas. It's the same. They're both the same. Wada, clear. Type. So this hadith, so if it's a recoverable illness, something which can be recovered from, you make up. Like we talked about the uh, ayat in Surah Baqarah, we discussed this in, uh, I think, session two or three. Yeah, um, Baqarah 185, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am in Ukhar, you make it up from the days afterwards, so other days, in, in, in Shawwal, in um, uh, Dhul Qadah, Dhul Hijab. It's better to finish as soon as possible. Otherwise, it, it becomes pending, especially the sisters. Sometimes you have sisters, uh, who miss fasts, and then it becomes difficult for them to fast. They're, they're busy with their household uh, duties, the husband, children, and nobody else is fasting, subhanAllah, in the house. Till the next shawwal. And the shawwal comes, and now they have to 
rush to make up because brothers and sisters, the fasts have to be made up before the next Ramadan. So anybody who's listening who missed last Ramadan fasts, you still have one or two days left because we are almost in the end of Shawwal now. Yeah? So you have to make up before the next Ramadan. And if you cannot, it is a sin upon you. You still have to make up and some scholars say you have to feed as well and ask Allah repentance. So these are very important points. Many Muslims take it very lightly. And once Ramadan is finished, khalas, they forget about it. Like they forget the Quran, they forget everything else. And then uh, before the next Ramadan, they're counting the days. Oh, how many days did I miss? Was it six? Was it seven? Was it ten the previous year? And sometimes they have a backlog of two, three years. And we'll discuss all of that, inshallah. We have a special section um, for sisters. And, and, and because they have sometimes nursing, uh, they have to, they're pregnant at times, they have uh, postpartum bleeding and so on. So, inshallah, we will discuss that. If somebody dies without making up, what do I mean? So, let's say a brother had missed uh, three days or five days fast, five days fast, right? For a valid reason. He had a valid reason, traveling, sickness, whatever, five days missed. Now, in Shawwal, he intended, inshallah, to make up. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his soul before that. He died. So what happens? So five days have missed, been missed. So is it okay? What does he do? Because he's dead now. He can't feed. Is it okay because it is Allah who took the soul? Uh, anyone knows? Please raise your hands if you have the answer. Or you can use the chat box. What does he do? Okay, he cannot do anything because he's dead, sorry. But what is, what is, uh, is there any thing to be done at all in the first place? Or it's written off because, you know, he died. Let's say he died on 30th of Shawwal. So, you know, he had those 29, 30 days. He, could, uh, he couldn't make up for whatever reasons. Now, and, and he wanted to make up those five days, but he couldn't. Hmm. Now, brother, yeah, yeah, but then. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa Ustad, maybe I think that maybe his children could, uh, if he's left behind an estate or some something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they can use that to uh, feed, Sorry. say, uh, four people or how many, however many days he's missed. Sorry, barakallah, jizakallah. And someone says in the chat box, he can give money to the poor or fast for him, his kids can feed the poor. Nah, nah, barakallah, jizakallah. Sorry. Now, so... Ideally, ideally, what would happen because he missed five days? And this is very, very important to let somebody know in the family. Because, for example, if I missed five days, la qadr Allah, and I die, and nobody knows I missed five days, mushkil. This is a big problem for me. Yeah. So it's better to keep somebody informed, like the wife or the husband or the, some children, if you have. Yeah, that you know I missed five days and I need to make up in Shawwal. So at least somebody knows. Right? Or update your wasiya, the will, mention it in there. Because somebody should know. Why? Because what happens in this case is that if he died without making those five making up those five days of Ramadan, first option is his heirs, the people who inherit from him. So maybe his wife, maybe his parents, maybe his children, if they're all inheriting from him. One of them can volunteer and fast five days for the father. So maybe the son says, okay, I will fast all five days for my father. He does it. Or the daughter says, no, even I want to, you know, chip in. So maybe the son does two days, the daughter does three days, whatever. The wife does one day and they do two, two, whatever. They can also split it or one person, one heir does everything, all the five days. This is the first option. The second option, if they don't want to fast, which is a bit rare, I, would, I don't think any son or daughter would not want to fast, fast sorry, for their parents missed fasts. But it's possible if, if somebody says, no, we don't want to fast. What is the second option? The second option is like most of you said, is to take money from the dead person's wealth before it's distributed. Take out that money for feeding the poor. So now in this case, five days in our example, five Muslims, he feeds, uh, what did we say, one and a half kilograms. So approximately that much money is taken out and you, you prepare a meal with that and you feed five Muslims. It is better to feed them than give money to them. It is better to feed them because ideally he would feed, right? So this is what these are the two options available uh, for the heirs uh, to make up uh, for the person who died. 
in case he has any missed fasts. Uh, for the sisters, uh, in case they have their uh, menstrual cycles, the aid, uh, they could be pregnant um, or they could be nursing. Now, again, sisters listening, please pay attention. The first option, default, is that you still fast. Okay, leave, leave, hey, forget hey, I'm sorry, for hey, this, you have to break your fast because you're, you're uh, in your monthly cycles and, and, the, and the sister is impure. So that's understood. But if a person, sorry, if a person is pregnant, a Muslim is pregnant, she's carrying, or she is nursing her infant, a newly born child, the first option when Ramadan comes is she will still fast. She will do her best to fast. Right? But in case that becomes a problem, either doctors inform her or her own health is deteriorating, whatever. In this case, only she breaks the fast. But otherwise, she tries her best to fast. Right? So I think this is a bit more clear. So for the pregnant and breastfeeding women, right? if she fears for herself, so she's pregnant and she fears for herself that if she fasts, uh, her health will deteriorate, deteriorate. Sorry, She must make up that fast at a later time. She can break, inshallah, and make up the fast. And if you're going to seek uh, an advice to the sisters and their husbands, if you're going to seek medical advice, seek it from good Muslim doctors. Don't go to, don't go to a kafir doctor and say, okay, my wife, this is a situation. Can she break her fast? The kafir will say, yes, of course she can break the fast. She should break the fast because the kafir doesn't want you to fast at all in the first place. So go to good Muslim doctors who know what they're talking about and they also know the deen. This is very, very important. Now, so she make, breaks the fast, but she makes it up at a later time. Barakla fikum. If she fears for herself, either because she's pregnant and, it, and, and she fears for her health, not the fetus, or she's breastfeeding and she fears for her health and not the infant. Now, the second point there in bold is if she fears for her child who's either in the fetus, in the womb, sorry, or uh, breastfeeding. If she fears for her child and will find it difficult to make up the month of fasting, of course, she breaks fasting in this case and plans on breastfeeding for the next two years because now, as we know in Islam, what is the duration for suckling in the Quran? It's mentioned in the Quran. Two years, two full years. This is the full time and this is the best time. And as we all know, breast milk is the best source of nutrition for a newly born child. It is the best source of nutrition. So we should not replace that with uh, supplements and powder milk. and Unless, of course, there is an issue, health issue or something else with the mother. Uh, because many times families, uh, the, the mothers, because of their whatever you know, consciousness and beauty and so on. They don't want to breastfeed or they want to be going, getting back to work, whatever. And they say, no, you know, I want to change this and, and give uh, some other milk. Yeah, This is not encouraged. Uh, this is the right of the child. In Islam, everybody has rights. Even non-living things have rights in Islam. The street, the pathway, it has rights. Likewise, Children also have rights upon their parents. They're giving them a good name, the aqika, and breastfeeding, and giving them good education. From some of the, some of the, there are maybe a couple of more honest. But the point is, this is the right of the child upon the parents. So you don't want to uh, mess up with the children's rights, do we? So the full term is two months. Sorry, two years. Two years. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran meaning of which is if this needs to be reduced for whatever reasons, there has to be a consensus between the husband and the wife. So let's say you want to make it only one year for whatever reason, so one and a half years. So both the husband and the wife need, need to mutually agree on this. So anyway, coming back to this point. Um, so if, if the Muslima is going to be breastfeeding, and so now we have approximately two years of breastfeeding, Plus this particular month, the current year, she can't fast because she is, you know, pregnant maybe. So totally maybe you have three years. 
Now three years times 30 is what? Sorry, three, three months times 30 is 90 days of fasting. There is ikhtalaf in this matter. There is a difference of opinion in this uh, matter among scholars. A group of scholars say she should still do those 90 days. She should still do the 90 days. But what, what happens if she gets pregnant again? After breastfeeding, the following year, maybe she gets pregnant again. So that again, a month gets carried over. So the other group of scholars say, no, in this case, she can, if it's a long duration, like 90 days is a long time. She can then uh, feed a poor person for every day missed. The second point there in the last, if she can fast the following year and she's not pregnant or breastfeeding, now she must make up the fast that I missed. So let's say she breastfeeds for a year and that she has only 30 days missed or 40 days, whatever. Maybe 45, she couldn't do the previous month. In this case, she has to uh, make up those days instead of feeding. So each case, what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters, is each case is a bit different. You can't give a general ruling Though I have put a general ruling there on the, on the screen, but it's not always applicable. Each sister, uh, her husband, they need to reflect and see what is their situation. You know, what is what is feasible, what is possible. Always keep in mind when you're making a decision and you're making a choice that fasting is a better option. If you can fast, please fast. But if you really, really cannot, then you feel. This is the advice to the sisters. Sometimes you may start fasting, so let's say you had to make 45 days, you started fasting 10 days, but then after this you couldn't for whatever reasons. Then you inshallah you feed the balance inshallah. But try to try to focus in, in your in your heart in the niyyah, because in the malamal of niya, intention, make it that you know I want to fast. And inshallah, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for you, inshallah. Tayyip. The other case, apart from the travelers and the sick and the elderly and the sisters. Sorry, the sister situations. When else is it permissible in the Sharia to break your fast? At war. And the hadith for this is in, found in the seerah of Rasulullah at Makkah, towards the end of the Madinan period. Rasulullah was marching towards Makkah. They were fasting. This happened in the month of Ramadan. And they were fasting. So Rasulullah in a place called uh, close to Makkah, close to Makkah. In a place called Qura al Ganim, well, Ganim, sorry, he uh, told the Muslims that the, the next day you will have, you need your energy because they could be fighting. Nah? And uh, he encouraged them to break their fast. So he commanded them rather, sorry. Abu Sayyid al Qudri radiallahu anh, said, We traveled with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Makkah when we, when we were fasting. We made a stop and the Messenger said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning of which is, you have drawn close to your enemy, the Quraysh in, in Makkah. Huh? And breaking our fast will make you stronger. So break your fast. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stood on a vantage point on a rock. He took a glass of water. And in front of everybody, he dragged from it, breaking his fast. And some other riwayats say this happened after Asr. After Asr. So they had a short time, maybe an hour, whatever, Allahu alam, for iftar. Yet he broke the fast. And the hadith continues actually, just to explain a bit more. There were a few Sahabi, I think three of them, if I remember right, who thought to themselves nah, that, you know, it's not very long before iftar and we can manage. We have enough energy, alhamdulillah. Let's continue fast. When Rasulullah heard this, he became very angry. His face changed color. He stood again on a vantage point and he announced to the Muslims, what is it with people that they do not follow the sunnah? They don't follow the command. And the way of Rasulullah, and this is sunnah as well, in correcting others, is that he would not name people. He would never pinpoint and say, you did this, Audhu Billah. And that's a beautiful way to rectify and correct errors without embarrassing anyone. And that's a sunnah which is lost today. You know, we, we love to find fault with people and we identify them and find fault with them. This is wrong. Either physically or on social media, whatever. This is not the sunnah. 
So he was very angry with this. So it also brings us to another point that the sunnah is meant to be followed. When Rasulullah said, break your fast, break your fast. When he said, this is how you fast, that's how you fast. When he said, take your rituals of hajj from me, you do your hajj exactly like how Rasulullah did his hajj. When he says, Salu usalli, you pray exactly as he prayed. So the sunnah is complete, brothers and sisters. His sunnah is home, his sunnah with his wives, his sunnah with his children, his sunnah with his friends and colleagues and companions, his sunnah at war, his sunnah in the, in the, in the souk, in the marketplace, while sleeping, in salah. Like Imam Malik, rahimallah, he said in the hadith, the Imam of Medina, that the sunnah is like Noah's ark. Noah alayhi salam, Noah alayhi salam, you know, he built a boat in which he was saved with many other uh, animals and everything, and the rest were drowned. So he said, it's like Noah's ark. Whoever is on it will be saved. Whoever is, denies it will be drowned. Time. The next section, that was like the exemptions and, and who's allowed to break the fast. Hope it's clear, inshallah. If not, we will, uh, you know, take it in the question and answer session. And I'm planning to do in the end a special session on Q&A. Uh, we'll answer all your questions, including zakat, zakat al-fitr, and all of these kind of things. Uh, maybe during Ramadan, because I, I can't finish today. So we'll kind of continue in Ramadan, inshallah. But in Ramadan, the time is a bit different. Maybe we'll do it a bit earlier. Today, same day, Yom Sab, but maybe 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Saudi time. I've not decided. 1 or 2 p.m. Saudi time now. Because this time is you know, Taraway and everything. All right. So what are the, what are the Nawaqid of Asiya? What breaks fasting? What nullifies fasting? First and foremost, eating, drinking, or smoking. This is what most people know already, right? Except the last. Some people don't know smoking breaks your fast. Yeah. But most Muslims, Aksariyat, they know eating and drinking breaks your fast. It's very simple and easy. But smoking will also break your fast. And smoking, by the way, brothers and sisters, is haram. It is not makru, it is haram. It is prohibited. Whoever does it is liable to be punished by Allah. And whoever leaves it for the sake of Allah, because it is haram, will be rewarded. And we said, brothers, subhanAllah, yani, especially in summer, the fast can be 16 hours, 18 hours in some countries. Maybe 20 hours in some northern countries. They stop smoking for the entire 16 hours. But immediately after iftar, they, ah, they Allah, they light up. Subhanallah. Ya Sheikh, Ya Akhi, Ya Captain, when you can stop smoking for 16 hours, can't you stop completely? See, the point is, brothers and sisters, as Muslims, the, the, the issue we have today with our weak iman and our lack of consciousness of Allah and taqwa is that we look at the Surgeon General's warning on the packet. Cigarette smoking is injurious to health. It causes cancer, diseases of the lungs, arteries. And then we think, oh, okay, fine. Maybe I should stop smoking. Yeah, Sheikh, what about it being haram? Ah, the body, I don't really care about it. This is what we have. This is the problem we have. We're not stopping it because it is haram. We're stopping it because maybe we will die because of cancer or lung diseases. You see, there's a big difference between the two. If you stop it because you're, it, it's haram, you will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is great ajr. But if you stop it because you know you may die of cancer or lung diseases, then there is no reward. So as Muslims, you want to do things and not do things because Allah commanded so. Or Allah prohibited it from, from, from doing that. That should be our first priority. Time. So this is clear. Eating, drinking or smoking will break your fast. Number two, anything as the same as eating or drinking. Whatever is, is similar to that. What does it mean? Anything which nourishes your body. Because what do, what do the scholars say when they understand these aspects? That eating and drinking, what does it do? It nourishes your body. So bakiyas, bakiyas, anything with the same as eating and drinking, like blood transfusions, IV drips, intravenous drips, whatever they call them. Yeah. All of this will break your fast. So if somebody needs, <coughs> excuse me, a blood transfusion, during the day, and he's fasting, and it's absolutely required. Uh, if he can delay it, it's good. 
of Riftar, but if it's absolutely required, then this inshallah will break his fast and he has to make up the mistake. Likewise, glucose drips, IV drips, and so on and so forth. Number three is intentionally vomiting. So like sticking your fingers into your throat and throwing up, that would break your, break your fast. But if the vomit happens unintentionally, nah, maybe you had a huge suhoor, whatever, this will not break, inshallah, break your fast, but intentionally vomiting will break your fast. Number four, taking out blood in large amounts. So, if somebody is in an accident during the day in Ramadan, and he is profusely bleeding, he's bleeding a lot, his fast is broken, he has to make it up. Likewise, also hijama, you know, the cupping and the sunnah, it's highly uh, recommended sunnah, especially for sicknesses, for diseases, even for magic and, and jinn issues. Uh, hijama is, is, is a very, very uh, amazing sunnah and a proven sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa where they do cupping and they, and they extract blood out. Now, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, inshallah. So this will break your fast because it's taken out in large amounts. Right? And this is the most stronger opinion, inshallah. But a small amount of blood coming out, so let's say, for example, you're chopping onions in the kitchen and you slice your finger slightly and this small amount of blood which comes out. Or you have to give a blood group test. You know, when they test you uh, by pricking your finger, are you B positive, B negative, A, B positive, whatever, yeah? They just take a small amount of blood. These things, inshallah, will not break your fast. They will not break your fast. But don't drink the blood, yes? Because sometimes people have the habit that when they when they slice their finger and starts bleeding, what do they do? The first reaction, they put their finger in their mouth and they suck the blood. This is wrong. Because you're taking in blood now inside your body. Type. Uh, so, if this is a small amount, it's fine, inshallah. You just put a bandaid over it or whatever, and your fast is valid, and you continue your fast, inshallah. Number five, we already discussed this for the sisters, the head or the post-birth bleeding, which they have, they could have it for a month, 40 days, whatever. All this will break their fast. Number six is the discharge of money. Money is the sperm. In the Arabic language, they call it money. So this discharge will break the fast. Time. Number seven, sexual intercourse will also break the fast. Why did I separate these two? Because even sexual intercourse, you, you discharge money. Now, nah, sperm is discharged. Why do we separate this? Because number six relates to the secret habit as well. Somebody may do the secret habit, and I hope, inshallah, you know what I'm talking about, and they discharge. Now, you have two sins here. One, you did this during the day in Ramadan. And two, that sin in and of its that act in and of itself is a sin. So there are two sins now. The secret habit is haram. The secret habit is haram. And this is the correct opinion, inshallah. And now you're doing it in Ramadan during the day. So double sin. Number seven, approaching the spouses during the day is also uh, going to break your fast. After iftar, alhamdulillah. The spouses are halal for each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has these decreed. You may approach them. But during the day, no. That's why, you know, we usually try to warn the youngsters uh, who are newly married. Sometimes it's difficult to, you know, uh, cut, what shall we say, uh, restrain yourself. Nah, because kissing by itself, kissing your spouse during the day will not break your fast. But sometimes if you just got married yesterday and today you kiss your wife and this may lead to something else. So it's best to avoid is the advice I would give. But otherwise, you know, kissing itself will not break the fast. Number eight, the secret habit itself, yeah, even without discharge, will break the fast. And finally, number nine, even the intention to break your fast will break the fast. Because if, if you remember, we talked about in lesson, uh, in session one or session two, if I remember right, I think, uh, maybe session two, uh, how do we start fasting? We make an intention, right? We make an intention the night before the first of Ramadan. So if tomorrow is Ramadan first, tonight after Maghrib, I make my intention that I want to fast the month of Ramadan. We talked about this earlier. Nah? So like you started your fasting just with the intention. You didn't make any dua, you didn't say anything, you didn't have a big ceremony, nah, nothing, only intention. Alhamdulillah. 
Likewise, even if you intend to break your fast, it will break your fast. Even if you didn't put a sip of water in your mouth. So for example, this example I always give my students, I'm driving back home, right? And Zahma a lot of traffic jams, it's iftar time, everybody's rushing home, uh, people are buying stuff and getting back home, whatever. I'm going back home from work and uh, I'm stuck in traffic. And I thought I would make it home, so I didn't have anything with me. I don't have a glass of water, I don't have anything, nothing to eat or drink in the car. I'm driving. And now I hear the adhan and I see the time, it's done. It's time for iftar. What should I do? Should I go back home, maybe it takes another 15, 20 minutes and then eat something and break my fast? It's, first of all, it's not required. And secondly, then I'm delaying the breaking of my fast. I just intend to break my fast. Alhamdulillah, my fast is broken. And then I can go home and eat and drink and whatever. Clear? Wada? So these are the things, brothers and sisters, which actually uh, will break your fast. In the Hadith in Bukhari and also in Fatal Bari, and Fatal Bari is the explanation of Sahih Bukhari, a beautiful book, Fatal Bari. Now, Rasulullah has some said meaning of which is if he forgets, the Muslim or the Muslim forgets and eats and drinks, then let him complete his fast. For Allah has fed him and given him to drink. According to another riwayah, he does not have to make up the fast or offer kafara or expiation. What is this talking about? So let's say, for example, Tomorrow is first of Ramadan. So I, you know, Abu Basim was not fasting Shawwal, absolutely. I didn't fast anything of Shawwal. So uh, I've just been eating and drinking, having a nice time. So first of Ramadan is tomorrow. I start fasting, alhamdulillah. And then, you know, there are some dates in the house. i walking by in the morning. I see a date, I pick it up and I put it in my mouth. I start eating. And then I realize, subhanAllah, today is Ramadan. What have I done? So this was completely unintentional and I did not remember it was Ramadan. I forgot and I just put it in my mouth. What do I do? Do I have to spit it out, vomit it out and, and, and repeat the day? No. Based on this hadith, I do nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is Allah who has fed him and given him to drink. So Alhamdulillah. No problem. But what is important is that you did this unintentionally. Unintentionally. Likewise, the fast, with, with respect to those nullifiers and everything, is still valid if the person was ignorant or unaware of the ruling of, of, of that action, breaking the fast. Right? So, for example, uh, what shall we say? Uh, the same thing. Let's say a person had an accident and he, he lost a lot of blood, but he thought it's still okay, I, I'm, I'm still fasting, and he continued fasting. Right, uh, without knowing that this this is actually broken this fast. As an example, it could be any other example. So in this case, the fast is valid, inshallah, because he was not aware of the rule. But again, the point, brothers and sisters, is that fasting is a pillar of Islam. Can I say I don't know how to pray? Can I say I don't know how to make wudu? Can I say Audu billah, I don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first pillar? So how can I say I didn't know what breaks the fast? These are serious matters, brothers and sisters. This is knowledge which is for the ayin, an individual obligation on each and every Muslim and Muslima. Everybody fasts at least a month every year. So how can we not get the knowledge? How can we be lazy? How can we be ignorant? How can we delay seeking this knowledge? This is for the ayin. If you're living for 50 years, you're going to be fasting every year, one month. How can you say at the age of 40, sorry, I didn't know that this breaks the fast. You have no excuse. Because it's a pillar of Islam. The point is we take Islam very lightly. We take Islam too lightly. We have made it a joke. Subhanallah, wallah, lazim. We have made it a joke. Islam is serious business because Jannah is serious business. But having said all of that, the academic ruling is what? If a person is sincerely in, unaware, ignorant, inshallah his fast is valid. Or he forgot and did something unintentionally. Likewise, the second point, his fast is still valid. 
or he was compelled to break his fast. And the compulsion, like what's happening in China, in Uyghur, uh, with the Uyghur Muslims, they are forced to break their fast at gunpoint. So this is again, uh, Allah will not put a burden upon you more than what you can bear. Of course, the exception the scholars give in all of this is that with respect to sisters, because Alhamdulillah, every sister knows when she has her head and postpartum bleeding that she is impure and she doesn't pray, she doesn't fast. This is something which is known. They don't need to attend a lecture to know that. They know this automatically through their parents and as they grow up and everything. Alhamdulillah. So we talked about approaching the spouse in Ramadan. This is very serious from those nullifiers. This specific one I've singled out because the kafara for this is very, very serious and very, very difficult. And the hadith uh, behind that, there's a story, and this is the hadith in, in Bukhari and also in Muslim Sahih. Abu Huraira radiallahu an, he said, a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, I am doomed, O Messenger of Allah. I am doomed, I am lost, Kala is finished. So Rasulullah replied, why are you doomed? He, the Sahabi said, I had intercourse with my wife, uh, that is assuming during the day, in Ramadan. Rasulullah sallallahu replied and asked him, can you free a slave? He said, no. Yeah, Rasulullah. Another rewayat, he said, I don't have any slaves to free. Then he asked him, can you fast for two consecutive months? He said, no, yeah, Rasulullah, I cannot, I don't have the capability to do that. And then he said, can you feed 60 poor people? Rasulullah said, sorry, the, the Sahabi said, yeah, Rasulullah, in the whole of Medina and the surroundings, this happened in Medina, of course, in the whole of Medina and its surroundings, I am the poorest person. I am the poorest person. So, A, I don't have the money and B, where can I find 60 people who are poorer than me? So Rasulullah Sassam kept quiet and the Sahabi sat down. It was a gathering of the Sahaba. He sat down. After a while, somebody brought some dates, a plate full of dates in a Sahan for Rasulullah Sassam. Rasulullah Sassam said, where is the question of the Sawali, where is the person who is asking the question? So the Sahabi stood up, the same Sahabi, he stood up. Rasulullah told, gave him the, date of, the, the plate of dates and he said, take this and feed your family. Because there's nobody else poorer than you. So take this and feed your family. This hadith, why am I saying this hadith? Because the ruling for the kafara of approaching your spouse in Ramadan is based on this hadith. And we'll come to that. We have a separate slide on, on, on each of those aspects. But for now, just remember the hadith. We talked about this. Rasulullah asked him first about freeing a slave. Then he said, can you pass two consecutive months? Uh, and here when we say consecutive months, what do we mean, brothers and sisters? Let's say somebody does this, right? This, this issue. And um, he cannot free a slave because he doesn't have slaves. The next option for him, and this is an order, this is a priority sequence. Yeah. The next uh, option for him is to fast two consecutive months. So let's say he did this. So he has to now fast 60 days. He starts fasting, let's say, on 2nd of Shawwal. First is Haram, because Eid, 2nd of Shawwal. He goes until, let's say, 11th of Shawwal, the 10 days he fasts. And then he falls seriously sick. Until the 20th. He recovers on the 20th of Shawwal. The 21st of Shawwal, can he start from day 11? No. He has to now start again from day 1. The clock is reset. The timer is reset. It has to be two consecutive months without a break. So you can see how difficult this is. That is why we advise the youngsters and the newly married people to kind of avoid their spouses during the day. After iftar, alhamdulillah, no problem. Uh... The secret habit, we said, is haram in and of itself. I'm not discussing the ruling of that. That's not the context. But if someone wishes, we can take it up in the Q&A or ask me separately. Uh, it is based on Hadith Qudsi. The desires. Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, meaning of which is, he gives up my food and drink and desire for my sake. And the secret habit is based on desire. 
So I'm not talking about the haram of it. Haram is different. That's a different rule. I mean, that's already understood and known. I'm talking about doing this during Ramadan. Because the hadith says, Allah subhanahu wa is saying that he, he will reward this person. Why? Because he gives up his food and drink and desire for my sake, for Allah's sake. The secret habit is driven by desire. Now, so causing ejaculation comes under the heading of the desire which the fasting person gives up. Rasulullah Sassam, what did he give as advice to the Shabab, to the youth in another hadith? When he was talking about marriage, he was encouraging the people to get married. He said, whoever of you can afford it should get married. Should get married. Because it helps to lower the gaze and protect your private parts because now you have your wife or the wife has the husband to channel their desires in the halal manner. And then he said in the hadith, whoever cannot afford it, what should he do? You have to fast. Because fasting helps you control your desires because you're hungry. How can you think of all of this when you're hungry and starving and thirsty? And you know you've given this up for the sake of Allah. You see? Yeah, this is the point I wanted to discuss, the, the summary of, of everything in terms of the nullifiers and their compensation, the kafara. So let's start on the left side with the first point there, the first column rather. So if a person breaks his fast without a legitimate excuse, small headache, cough, whatever, yeah, he breaks his fast without a legitimate excuse. It's a sin. And below that, he has to make tawbah because this is a sin. And finally, he has to make up those missed days before the next Ramadan. So three things to do. Understand it's a sin. Seek repentance, tawbah. Uh, make a firm resolve never to repeat it. And finally, make, make up those missed days. Number two, the next column. If he breaks the fast with a legitimate excuse, travelers, sisters with aid, uh, temporary illness. We talked about this, right? Old people, weak people, uh, people on, on uh, constant medical uh, care and attention. For them, all they have to do, uh, sorry, sorry, that I'm, I'm, missing, I'm mixing up two and three. Okay, the two is only uh, like, you know, temporary illness or travelers or the sisters with Haid. They will make up the days before the next number. Number three, the third uh, column, uh, the middle column there is the people who are incapable now with old people, medical care, all those kind of stuff. They uh, will feed, like we said, a needy Muslim half a sa of the local food which they themselves eat, the same quality. Number four is what we just talked about, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, the sexual intercourse thing. First thing, it's a sin. So because it's a sin, you have to seek repentance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you also have to make up those missed days before next Ramadan. So if it's one day, one day has to be made up after Ramadan. If you did it two or three days, those two or three days have to be made up after Ramadan, before the next Ramadan. And finally, that's the order we talked about in the hadith just now. You also have to free a slave. Apart from making tawbah and making up the missed days, you also have to free a slave. Ustad, there are no slaves today. Fine. Then, if you don't have a slave, you have to fast two consecutive months. Ustad, I can't do this. I'm too thin. I'm weak. Uh, I don't think I can do this. Only then you go to number three, which is feeding 60 needy people. 60 needy people. If the wife is forced, some women are usually, uh, by the nature of their creation, weaker than men, physically. So if, if a wife is forced by, uh, by her husband, and, the, and she tries to resist, but, and she also advises him probably that this is Ramadan, what are we doing? But he forces himself on her now. She doesn't have to do the tawbah because this is being forced upon her. But she still has to make up the missed day up, up before next Ramadan and uh, try to do those things at the bottom. Finally, number five is what we also talked about. This kind of summary slide. If somebody dies uh, having missed days to make up and he couldn't make up. So the air is fast. <clears throat> Excuse me. The air is fast. And if they don't fast and they want to feed, it's it's wajib to take the wealth from the inheritance which the dead person has left behind. Barak Lafikum. 
Aisha radiallahu anha, our mother, Uman Mumineen, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if anyone dies, meaning of which is if anyone dies and he owes some days of fasting, his heirs should fast on his behalf. So here Bukhari 174. So the heirs should make up that fasting on his behalf. So it's like we said earlier, it's, it's better for that them to do this rather than just feed because of the hadith of Rasulullah from Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, likewise, in terms of other things which need to be avoided, because these can also potentially break your fast. Lying, obscene language and immoral behavior. Sahih Bukhari, meaning of which is whoever does not give up lying speech, false statements, and acting on those lies and evil actions, Allah is not in need of his leaving his food and drink. So it's a <clears throat> excuse me, it's a way of saying that the fast is, is null and void. But there's no point leaving your food and drink if you can't stop lying. Remember the definition of fasting we saw in, in session number one. We said to stay away from food, drink, sexual intercourse, and anything else which can break your fast. This is what the last part means. Anything else which can break your fast. And subhanAllah, today Muslims, yani, lying has become second nature to us. Earlier in the days of the Salaf and even later on that, if a person would say, I'm a Muslim, khalas. There is no need for any signature. Put your thumbprint here. Give me an attestated affidavit. No, you're a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, I take your word. That was the way it was. Today, if somebody says, I'm a Muslim, he said, ah, tal, tal. Put your signature. Put your thumbprint. Make an attestation. Uh, uh, validate this by 10 uh, judges and only then I will accept your word. This is the situation. Because Muslims have become known liars today. And we don't even know. The problem is, we don't even know we are lying. And we don't even know it is a sin. Likewise, obscene language, foul mouthing in Ramadan, subhanallah. Normally itself it is wrong. Rasulullah says in the other hadith, a person lies and continues to lie until Allah writes him down as a liar and he ends up in hellfire. And a person speaks the truth and continues to speak the truth until Allah writes him down as a truthful person and he ends up in Jannah. So lying in potentially brothers and sisters take us to the hellfire. Ah, this is another problem we have. SubhanAllah. Allah understand. Backbiting and slandering. And Rasulullah has defined these terms for us. The dictionary may give you something else. We don't really care, right? Webster's, Mariam Webster's, whatever. I don't know, Wikipedia, whatever dictionary is out there. Huh? Oxford. No, we don't care about this. We care about the definition that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has given us about backbiting and slandering. And he, he referred to this and he said, would you like to eat the, the flesh of your dead brother? So a person, your brother you, is dead. He's lying on the floor. Would you like to cut open his flesh and eat it? Yo, it's, it's loathsome. It's, it's repulsive. That is what is backbiting. Rasulullah said, backbiting, <clears throat> excuse me, is talking about your Muslim brother, of course. Muslim brother or sister. The sisters are talking about sisters. Nah, because we don't want brothers talking about sisters, obviously. Yeah? So, uh, a brother talking about his Muslim brother behind his back in a way in which he will not like it. So, if I am talking about Abdullah with you, and Abdullah is not present here, he's Ghaib. In a manner which Abdullah will not like it. If he's present, he will not like what I'm saying. This is backbiting. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu replied and asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, what if what we are saying is true? So, you know, Abdullah is actually like that. We are not lying. We are saying the truth. Rasulullah said, that is backbiting. If you are lying, that is slandering. That is even worse. So now you have the two definitions for backbiting and slandering. So we now to, we need to question ourselves and look into ourselves and see where we stand with respect to backbiting and slandering. How many times today? For example, today, just from this morning, 
take account. Like uh, Umar bin Khattab said in the famous saying, take account of yourselves before you are called to account. Take account for yourselves, of, of yourselves, before you are called to account. By whom? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, for example, on this morning, how many times have we bad people? What happened at work? What happened with this neighbor, with that neighbor? Even if it is you're speaking to your spouse, it doesn't make it halal. Because some people ask me once, Ustad, what if I go back home from the office, you know, and things happen in the office, and I tell my wife about it. Is that okay? How is it okay? That person you're talking about is still a Muslim. He's still a Muslim brother. You're still talking about him in a way he would not like, even if it's to your wife. It doesn't make it halal. Again, this is something we, we either don't have knowledge of or we take it very lightly. These are major sins in Islam. In the middle of the Shaiba, sorry, uh, Rasulullah said he does not observe fasting who continues eating the flesh of people. In Dalmi, also, he said, Salah in the Hadith, the fasting person is a state of worship as long as he does not backbite or hurt a Muslim. As long as he does not backbite or hurt a Muslim. Um, they have another hadith I forgot. I, don't, I, don't, I thought it was on the slides. I may have made a mistake. Anyway, another hadith about this aspect is, and this happened in the early part of uh, the Madinan period when fasting just became mandatory. Fasting became mandatory when Second year after Hijrah. Second year after Hijrah. So uh, a couple of ladies, they sent a messenger to Rasulullah in Madina, and they were also in Madina. And they sent him a messenger saying that, you know, we're finding a bit difficult to fast. Can we break our fast? This was still the initial, maybe the first year of fasting, Allahu Alam. So all the rules were not very clear or laid on laid down clearly. But they sent a messenger saying that, you know, it was maybe foreknown. And they asked, seeking permission from Rasulullah to break the fast. Because we are finding it a bit difficult. Rasulullah Sassam replied and sent back saying they have already broken their fast. They have already broken their fast. And they said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, we didn't do anything to break the fast. We didn't eat, drink, nothing. Rasulullah replied, but you have been speaking. You have been backbiting fula, fula since morning. So you have already broken the fast. So brothers and sisters, very, very dangerous. And we should use Ramadan as a, as, as a training ground to, you know, zip our tongues and zip our lips and everything. And subhanAllah, this was, sorry, nothing personal, but this was a domain when I was growing up for the sisters. You would usually see sisters constantly backbiting or not back, at least chatting, chatting. Okay. But today, the brothers have overtaken them. Wallahi, the brothers, mashaAllah, and they will stand outside the masjid after Maghrib and I've seen this personally. I mentioned this example earlier as well to my old students. So I've seen people standing outside the masjid when I leave Maghrib chit-chatting. I go back for Isha. They're still in the same spot, the same group, still chit-chatting. One hour. Talking deen? No way. No way. Where do people talk deen today for one hour? You know, politics and office politics and cricket and football and rugby, I don't know, this and that. And definitely there is backbiting somewhere. Because once you enter this avenue, it's difficult to stay away from backbiting and slander. So choose your friends carefully. Choose your friends carefully. As Rasulullah a person is on the deen of his friend. Hadith. It's a hadith sahih. That a person is on the deen of his friend. So choose your friends very carefully. This hadith in Ibn Majah and Sahih and Shaykh al-Albani, the Prophet said, meaning of which is the one who fasts may get nothing from his fast but hunger. And the one who prays Qiyam may get nothing from his Qiyam but a sleepless night. Because they have done all of these things we just discussed. So that kind of sums up the fiqh of fasting, that section of our agenda. So we talked about the conditions, the pillars, how do we determine the onset of Ramadan? We talked about how to start and stop fasting, when to start and stop fasting, the traveler's capability, what nullifies fasting, nawaqid. So all of this, alhamdulillah, 
we have covered. And for those of you who missed the previous sessions, again, like we said, you can go back and look at my channel and the playlist uh, Ramadan 1445. We are uh, into now mustahab actions. Actions which are preferred. Um, do you have any questions on what we covered today? If not, I'll just continue for another 10 minutes or so if you allow. And I plan to do classes either at 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. We may have one or two classes, maybe one class, and the last would be then a special Q&A session. Uh, same time, uh, Yom uh, Sab. Uh, obviously, we can't do it in the night. Uh, but uh, maybe 1 or 2 p.m. Is that okay for all of you? If not, let me know either in the chat box or in the group. Because I can't do it in the evening. It's, it's Iftar and then Isha and Taraweh and everybody is busy. But I think this time, one to two, depending on where you're joining from, would inshallah be suitable. Same day, Yom Sat. I need two more classes, inshallah, to wrap up. Um, and the last class, what of course, from the two, way will be a Q&A session, especially Q&A session. So that's the plan, inshallah. I will send you the invites, of course. So since nobody is asking questions, I will continue. Give me another five or ten minutes, inshallah. Uh, mustahab actions, right? Some extra things which you can gain ajar from. Apart from your fasting, what are the other areas you can get more ajar in this blessed month? The Quran. The Quran. Shahru Ramadan Razi Unzila Fihil Quran. Qudan lil nasi wal bayanati min huda. So the ayat, we saw this ayat in, in the Aqidah aspect of fasting, Surah Baqarah. And there's a very nice um, kind of picture someone sent me sometime back. Uh, where are you going? And You know, usually like what we do with the Quran, yes, Ustad said Ramadan is the month of the Quran, we have to read the Quran, fine. So we take the Quran, we read it cover to cover, alhamdulillah, two times, three times, four times in Ramadan. But after Ramadan, what do we do? We wrap it back up with a special velvet cloth, and put it back up on the top most part of the bookshelf above everything else huh? and forget about it till the next Ramadan. Or we take it when somebody dies and you want to read, which is a bidah. Or we take it when somebody gets married and, and read some ayat or something or hold it and the couple goes below it. All these are innovations. But otherwise, we don't read it. Forget following it. We don't even read it. This is a problem. And that is why we are misguided. That is why we are wandering all over the place like sheep, like blind cattle. Somebody says, this is halal, yalla. Somebody says, that is halal, yalla. They will, will water this guy. He says, oh, this is haram, okay. We have no clue. Absolutely no clue. Nor do most of us know the Arabic language. So we're just following. Remember, nafsi, nafsi, on the day of judgment, each one to myself. Nafsi, nafsi. Nobody will come to help you on the day of judgment. I will not come to help you. You will not come to help me. Yeah, it's easy to say, oh Allah, Ustad Abu Wasif said this, so I followed him. But will it fly on the day of judgment? No way. No way. You have to do your own research. You have to do your seeking of the own knowledge. Did what Abu Wasif said was, was it right? Who is Abu Wasif? Abu Wasif, Abu Wasif is a nobody. So, nafsi, nafsi. So, at least the Quran, this is the opportunity to go back to it, to read it, to understand it. Afala, huh? why, don't, why don't they ponder on the Quran? Ponder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, why don't they read the Quran? What is pondering? For pondering, you should first read it, and then you should understand it, and then you can contemplate and ponder upon it. Everything which we require in our lives, brothers and sisters, is mentioned and available in the Quran. Everything, everything. So this is a golden opportunity, this Ramadan, to get our hearts attached back to the Quran. And for those who don't know Arabic language, use this opportunity to understand what Allah is speaking to you. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu. That is you and me. Ya ayyuhalladina. This ayat comes in so many places. Not only in the Quran, in every single page, it, it, it multiple times in a single page. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu. Allah is saying, Ya ayyuhalladina. Oh, those who have believed. Allah is calling out to you and me. But do we know what he's saying after that? Absolutely no clue. And we say, Ustad, I read the Quran ten times. 
but still my heart is not softened and I don't know, I'm still sinning because you don't know what you read. Ustad, Arabic language, I don't know. Type, okay. Start learning, but in the meantime, go to the translation of the meaning in a language that you understand. At least for starters. Don't just sit back and say, sorry, I don't know anything. Allah will fall. Allah gafur rahim. Subhanallah. This is a major problem with the Ummah today. Sorry, brothers and sisters, I'm a bit uh, deviating here, but this is important. What did they say? Allah gafur rahim. Ah. Complete the ayat, brothers and sisters. Complete the ayat. Allah gafur rahim. Yes. Also was shadidu liqab. That's the full ayat. Gafur rahim was shadidu liqab. The most strict in punishment. The most strict in punishment. How come you have the Quran in your house? Maybe you have four or five copies and you don't know what it says. Well, this is the most important issue for you. And this is what you will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. But we know about physics and engineering and medicine and law and what um, Joe Biden did and what Trump did and who's going to win the US elections. Uh, which team won the football match today? Which team won the cricket match today? Who's starring in the next Bollywood movie, Hollywood? Everything we know. We don't know what Allah is saying in the Quran. Our Creator. And we expect our lives to be with blessings and barakah and happy lives and nothing. Okay, how can we? But this was the thing which changed the people, the people of Arabia, the Quraysh, people like Umar bin Khattab, people like Khalid bin Walid. Huh? They changed them from the worst of jahils to the best of Muslims. What, 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 what changed them? The Quran. The Quran. Did they go and study in Madina University? No. What changed them? The Quran. So the point I'm trying to make, brothers and sisters, and I think I'll stop with this because it's been a while now, is that this is a golden opportunity for us. Now. At least use the opportunity to understand, even if you don't finish the full Quran in Ramadan, there is no hadith to say that you have to finish the Quran once or twice or thrice in Ramadan. Bring me the hadith. There is no hadith to say this. Yes, it was the practice of Rasulullah that in the last Ramadan, he recited the Quran twice to Jibreel to make sure it is right and to keep it in the right places, the order of the chura, chapters and the ayat because he would not live to see the next Ramadan. But he did command us to do this. The point with us Muslims is we don't do what we are commanded to do. But we start doing things which we are not commanded to do anyway. I'm not saying you don't do it once or twice. You do it, please do it. But what is more important is to understand what you're reading. That is that is what I'm trying to drive across as a point. So don't say, Ustad said not to read, so I will not read it. No, please go ahead and read it. Definitely read it. The Ajar is there. But use this opportunity. Because I know after Ramadan, you will not go back to it. Maybe once in a week you will read it. Maybe Yom al Jumma, Maybe once in a month. So at least now, since you're doing every day, uh, maybe for Fajr, you read the ayat in Arabic. Maybe for Zohar Asar, try to understand the meaning of it. Or for after Isha, sit down in your house, open the tafsir, and see what you read. Even if you delay a bit and you can't finish it in a month, it's fine. I think I will stop now if I keep rattling off. Jazak uh, Mullah Khairan, if you have any quick questions on what we covered today, even otherwise, please write down your questions. So we'll do a special Q&A in the end. Again, brothers, next week, inshallah, will be Ramadan. May Allah make this Ramadan blessed for all of you. And may He accept your deeds, your siyam, your qiyam, uh, your taraweh, and your uh, recitation of the Quran. May I accept all of this and put it on the sales, on your scales of the day of, on the Day of Judgment. Um, so next week, inshallah, Yom Sabt, 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Saudi time. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe 1 p.m. Saudi time, if it's, if it's okay for all of you. I think 1 p.m. will be better, inshallah. Uh, I need two classes more. One class to finish off the slides which I have and another class only for Q&A. And we'll also take questions on Zakat al-Fitr because maybe many of you give Zakat in this month and you have some questions. Inshallah, I will look at that as well. Uh, we'll see you, Inshallah, next week. Yom Sabt, 1 p.m. Saudi time. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa tubi ilayk wa akhrad da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mantap atas nak